We are back with another reason review from Mr. Chibi episode 16. This is the one where Subaru tried to lick Priscilla's feet and then she threatened to kill her entire family. But it's funny. Joke's on her because we have no family here. What are you going to do, Priscilla? Isekai back to our world? It's that time a week mm. once again, my fellow Chibits. It's ReZero Day. The new Let's episode go! is here. And I got to tell you. And I got to tell you, man. It's ReZero Day every day in this channel. And there are still ungrateful monkeys complaining. I'm watching this shit too slow. If only they could do grade 3 rudimentary arithmetic math addition and figure out that if you count the days until October the release date, it just lines perfectly. One episode a day, but unfortunate, right? Unfortunate. The wait since last week's episode mm. to have this episode, it has been hell. I hear there was a huge hiatus, like a week or two after episode 15 and the credits start rolling. And then they're like, yep, we're going to take a break now. Because I have been wanting this at next episode so bad so bad like i am addicted to this series because i want to know what's going to happen and as i have said in my videos that i really really wish that either the web novel series or the light novels japanese translation if they were oh if they were i would definitely be reading ahead right now but sadly there is nothing and the wait for this series after last week's fantastic episode, it has been absolute hell. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to have the Get new episode it! here. But sadly, we gotta wait for next week, for the next episode. So the hell begins once again. Come on! So, this episode, okay. definitely not on the same level as psychological trauma, like as we saw in last week's episode with the... It was definitely not as, like, if you're going to say the peak of trauma is com uh, it not comparable, yeah. But, like, it was a different, it was, like, a different set of psychological, like, uh, problems this time, right? Because this time, Subaru is, like, overwhelmed with, like, anger, wrath, right? And instead of just being slothful and taking inaction because he's mentally collapsing, Betrugus's, uh therapy made him more mad than sad and depressed, and now he's out to just... Make alliances in the worst way possible. Just fucks it up with Krush. Fucks it up with Priscilla and Anastasia. But they all give us a valuable lesson that we should be learning. But I think that we're not going to learn anything. Like, I hope he took those words to heart. Each, three, each one of them gave us their own theme of what to learn and how to be better. But Subaru, like, again, just too angry right now to understand anything. You know, the cruelty of what happened to Rim and how being flexible or how flexible. <laughs> the rem jokes bro the rem memes <laughs> they're so good my favorite one is the i think the twister one is overused the haiku one is pretty funny though well she really is but this episode was good in its own way for different reasons and for that it mainly came down to politics and yes. discussions negotiations between yes. these higher people these Krush, nobles the Priscilla, royalty and stuff Anastasia. the next selection for the the ruler of the capital or the kingdom we get to see politics throughout the entirety of this episode and it's just something you would not expect to see because after last week's episode and how much hell Subaru went through and how much hell Rim went through you just you don't expect something like this the way this episode was done and it's actually the logical thing that would happen in everyday life and it which is one of the main reasons why I love Spice and Wolf so much because oh, some Spice of the you know, politics that were used in this episode reminded me a lot of Spice and Wolf. It really did. Like, for instance, the uh, Sun Coin arc. I'm not going to spoil anything, but it reminds me a lot. When he says politics, is he talking about the negotiations and the strategies of soft skills, you know, uh, when Anastasia was talking? I'm not sure. Of that, And then other arcs before that. So this episode hit my personal taste. Because, like, I don't think what Anastasia told us is politics. That's just negotiations, business. What Cruz told us, I think, is a bit more diplomacy. What Priscilla told us is <laughs> she just hates pigs. She Priscilla's weird. The more I think about it, the more like last night I was really thinking about it. Maybe we'll go over this during the actual analysis too. But she has this irrational hate for animals. Not any animals. It's the metaphor she uses: a dog's dependence or pig's greed. But she also calls Amelia half wit. So like she really obviously is superior in the sense that she's like a superhuman she thinks that everything is going to work out towards her favor and she views other beings as lesser beings she she low-key kind of has that nazi vibe that racist nazi vibe 
Speciest? I don't know. The way that she perceives, like, a dog's dependence or a pig's greed. The fact that you were not able to override those animalistic desires and instincts. As a human, you are a failure is kind of what Priscilla told us. Rather correctly, because I was happy to see just politics throughout the episode. So what was necessarily going on? So after the events of last week's episode, we know Subaru, he got this murderous intent in his mm. eyes. He, he just wanted to murder every bastard that did him wrong. He just wants to kill everyone. That, that's kind yes. of how Subaru was acting at the end of last week's episode. That outlash of we need to kill them all no matter what. I know the cult members are trash, but like, bro, in Crucia's place, when he was telling Crucia and everybody, like, we need to kill them no matter what, that's like the worst way to go about things, and I think that's like the angriest I've ever seen him. And there is something I need to talk about, which I actually forgot to mention in that video, and many of you, quite a bit of you, were asking about what? my thoughts on that scene, and I honestly, I completely let it slip my mind. What I, scene? I just, I, there was just so much to talk about, it slipped my mind. So I want to mention something from last week's episode that I didn't talk about, and that would be the sin of pride. For instance, that's the biggest shit, bro. Archbishop Pride, Super is what just stands, him being prideful, an empty position of pride being open. What would happen if we joined the cult? It's like the gospel, right? How Subaru, apparently he has pride, and the way it was hinted at, we know there was sloth being mentioned and stuff like that, so there is a possibility that... Even from the beginning, the Witch of Envy, first episode, Subaru directly says pride and the Witch of Envy is made, you can already make the connections of Seven Deadly Sins. ReZero was not being too discreet about it. There's multiple positions where Subaru directly says it. And the more I realize how some shows, the subs don't matter. As in the vocabulary, sometimes rather than saying Witch of Envy, there's a jealous witch, right? But in this show, the word actually matters. The synonyms is not allowed, right? Because like a pact, a contract, a covenant, Witch of Envy, not a Jealous Witch, right? Archbishop of Sin, there's so many actual words that if you had bad subs, then you wouldn't be getting these technical terminologies that the show is trying to tell you. Something to do with the seven deadly sins are a part of the series. For yes. instance, you know, Subaru, he's the sin of pride, and when we have the sloth... And he's not the sin of pride. The sin of pride, Archbishop position is open. Subaru is a very prideful person. The pride theme has been reiterated over and over. But that's also not the only sin that Subaru dabbles in. But that was very interesting when, you know, Betterugi said, are you pride? Simply due to him probably sensing the witch's miasma, right? In last week's episode, so with these different references, and we know that, you know, the seven deadly sins isn't something entirely new when it comes to manga, anime, and light novels, I'm willing to bet that whatever's going on here, when it comes to the witch following the, the actual jealous witch, I believe there's probably, Envy. like, the seven deadly sins underneath her, probably individual. You don't even know it's the fucking Witch of Envy because you got the shitty subs that says Jealous Witch. See what happens? Chibi's not able to make the connections from the beginning because he's been reading Jealous Witch the entire time. How are you supposed to make the connections with the Seven Deadly Sins when the subs you've been given literally fuck you up? Individual people are underneath her with like different titles like, you know, Sloth, Greed, Pride, Wrath, you get my point, Envy. And I, I, can f I feel like each individual disciple, maybe like the higher-ups, probably are, you know, one of these of the seven. That's what I'm assuming too, right? There is every witch for every sin, but Satala consumed them all. So there's only one witch that got sealed away, I guess. And then there's archbishops for each sin. The pride position is empty for whatever reason. And they still, like... Worship Satella though. I thought that I don't know an archbishop of sloth would worship the witch of sloth But obviously because Satella ate them all I guess there's only one witch to serve And deadly sins and that's probably why he asked is he pride are you pride because of the way you're acting But then he started calling him sloth. I don't think it's the act There's nothing prideful Subaru displayed during the interaction with better goose Subaru in that run was the embodiment of sloth if you consider his inactions to be slothful. It is simply because the position of pride right now is empty or someone is coming and no one knows who it is and Betrugus found somebody with such a dense smell of the witch's miasma that made him, you know, think that, are you pride? So I feel like that's what was going on there, just to give you my clarification and my thoughts on that scene. Now, talking about the ending inclusion of last week's episode, and then carrying it over into this episode, Subaru, after all he went through, 
he is at that point to where he's at madness, but he just wants revenge. He's a man that straight up just wants to murder a person. He just wants to kill someone after what happened to him. And I guess it is warranted. I mean, this man has been through so much hell already. I can see why he would want to kill someone. And after what he witnessed last week, which was probably one of the most brutal things he's seen so far, I could see why he'd be like he is. I feel like, yeah, no, no, no. The REM shit was brutal. I'm just still thinking about Petra's eyes being gouged out. Why? That was just out of fucking nowhere and so just disturbing. Maybe Petra's eyes are like special. Or maybe the cult member just said fuck Petra in specific. <laughs> I don't know. So it carries us over into the mansion, the place he's been staying at with one of the actual next uh, royal candidates. And Krush. he has a conversation. He's like, hey, the witch's cult is going to be attacking the domain to where Amelia is and then, you know, killing innocent civilians. I need your help. I need you to send a force or anything for you can help because I don't want nobody to die. I don't want these innocent civilians to die. I actually was surprised when Subaru immediately asked Krush for help. I thought it'd take a while for him to realize that he can't do these things alone, but already he goes in wanting help, but he goes in the wrong way. Even when asking for help, you need to be able to give the other party a reason to help. Krush is an opponent faction during this royal selection arc. Why the fuck would she help us? It's in their best interest to just sit silent and let Amelia's faction get fucked up by the witch's cult, then that's one faction gone. There's nothing Krush gains from risking her men in this mission. And why would anyone believe you? You just happen to know exactly the time and day of when they attack. Are you from the witch's cult? Is this a setup? Everything about this is so suspicious, I do not blame Krush at all. And Subaru's just pleading for help at the beginning of the episode. He's like, please, please help me. I mean, you can see the rage in his eyes, how angry he is, the way he carries himself. And it's to be expected. I mean, he just had to go for experience like last week's episode. And of course, he'd still have this anger in him. And we've already seen that he's very mentally unstable. And we get to see once again how one of our characters mentions how much madness he currently has in him. How he's just so mad and how angry he is and how he believes what he's talking about is actually the truth and not a lie. Which we know he's telling the truth, but not many people would believe him so talking about it in detail Subaru he's just pleading for help he's like that part with Krush was kind of confusing because she apparently has never lost a negotiate like a debate or some sort of deal right because she's always so cautious and like she can like feel the vibes you can know when you're kind of lying and like Subaru everything he said wasn't a lie and then she told him I think there's like two important lines she said one was like if you don't even believe in your own lies, how do you expect other people to? And then the other one was, the fact that you believe in your lie is an entire madness. And I thought that was a little bit contradicting. I probably need to revisit that scene. But those were the most important lessons that Krush told us. Along with, give someone, give the uh, fucking, the other party that you're trying to like deal with a reason. Like they need to gain something from this. But we don't know the incentives of them because we haven't really learned about Wilhelm, Felix, Krush, if we could figure out their backstory, if we could figure out what they got going on and try to piece in, like, what can we do to give them something? Give them a reason to ally up. Like, please help me. And as the conversation carries on, eventually it turns into politics. Like, what do I get out of helping you? Like, why would I help someone that's a part of the royal selection? Like, why would I help someone else? My rival, a person I'm going up against. Why would I? I think it'd be really useful if we allied up and said, you know what? If you help Amelia's faction, we will promise to team up and take down Anastasia and, uh, Anastasia and Priscilla together. And then when there's only, and felt, I guess, and then when there's only two of us left, then we can have a deal. That shit kind of works in like shows like Survivor, right? If you've seen Survivor, a lot of the times people are against each other, even in their own teams, and they got to figure out alliances and try to figure out some sort of mutual benefit. And these alliances kind of do that, where it's like, all right, you and me, let's just, you know, vote everyone else out and until the very end we'll have this alliance and then we'll fight against each other i help them why how does it benefit me in any way and and to be real it makes a lot of sense i mean that's right. how politics are done or any type of negotiation when it comes to this like why would i help someone else out when i don't benefit from it? now True. obviously to be a kind person you would just help them out regardless but in that type there is no kindness here. That's naivety. I would never fucking help Subaru if I was in Crucius' position. He would be so suspicious. I would not risk my own men. This sounds like a fucking trap. 
And if I could smell the witch's stench, then it would be even more suspicious, but it seems like only Rem can right now. Of age to where there's royal selection and all that, I mean, you're battling for power, and there's constantly, like, assassinations and crazy shit going on behind the scenes. Stuff like that happens, and you need to get something out of it, like some form of equal exchange. Yeah. And she was like, what could you offer me? What can you offer me for equal exchange? And we can learn that if we just take our time and learn other characters and spend more time with them, right? But, like... He's too mad and angry and trying to rush it. Like, every run, it's like, we need to go to the mansion, we need to go save, then time is running out, right? So obviously there's this irrationality that is blocking us. We're tunnel visioned. If I was to help you out. And eventually the entire negotiation went south, and Subaru, he, he got really pissed off. It was just really fucked up how many of the royal candidates were just asking for Subaru for something of equal exchange. Is it fucked up? I think it's more fucked up to be demanding that if I was Krush, that my own people get sacrificed, potentially to be sacrificed to help out the opponent faction without anything in gain. That sounds fucked up. Why should I go on and help? Because it's a nice thing to do. This is a fucking royal selection and I'm going for the throne. There is no kindness. There is no charity. Like, this is fucking war and business. Like, I'm not fucking around with that. You think I would risk this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for that? You would think, you could probably say that that is like immoral or unethical, but again, this is not supposed to be morally correct or unethical time. This is wartime, and what like Subaru is saying is unreasonable to kind of like negotiate with. And they just didn't give a shit about anything else at all. They didn't care that innocent lives were actually in, you know, in jeopardy that were about to die. It made me absolutely sick when I saw these individual characters. Like, you know, the one with the green hair and all that, just seeing how she reacted. A little bit of a white knight take here from Chibi. I think it was a fucking reasonable take. You could even argue, again, the reason we give a fuck about the village people is because we have seen those people from Subaru and Amelia's perspective and hung out with them, and we can empathize with them. Obviously, they're going to matter more. But, like, you're not even thinking about the possibility of Crucius people getting slain during this battle against the witch's cult, right? You don't care about them, but you care about the village people. This is a contradiction. No, I'm saying fuck both of those people. I'm looking at this from an objective perspective of who's going for the throne. It just doesn't make sense to help out right now. In this episode, and Subaru's like, are you just going to let these people die an entire... Yes, yes I will. In fact, I wanted to burn the fucking village down already in episode 5. Alright, village dying? You're not gonna help anyone when you have the power? And, and he's like, I, I, you're disgusting me. You're not gonna help the weak. And I agree with Subaru. I mean, Subaru has been an ass. He has a lot of issues with his personality, which I have discussed. And it adds character on what he's going through right now, and all of this madness and this anger and everything he feels right now, it is character development to show us that he is not perfect, and that yeah, he sure. is changing, he is evolving. He's no, he's evolving into something bad right now, To be, in my opinion. This run, I thought that he would change. Yeah, he changed from a mentally insane person to angry fuck who's burning every bridge. Evolving into something different. And I love the direction his character is going. I do too. Just because he's fucking up doesn't mean it's bad. I'm enjoying it. It's a fucking train wreck what we're seeing right now. But I don't think for a second that was Subaru's action right now, the way he's portraying himself. Sure, it's a nice thing to be able to save the villagers. Sure, it'd be nice. But at the end of the day, this is not a selfless act. This is acting selfless out of selfish desires because he wants to save Amelia and be the one person that can save everything to prove himself. Because at the end of the day, it's not about saving Amelia, right? Krush literally confronted Subaru about that. It's a, it was never about saving Amelia. Even though that is the byproduct of his goal, that was never stated once, and Krush used that in the argument, and Subaru had a moment of realization that, like, holy shit, what am I doing? And I have to admit, I'm on Subaru's side in this. I mean, I understand when it comes I'm not. I'm not, and if you're gonna call me fucked up for that, I don't think you're even watching the episode with an objective fucking perspective. Just the politics and negotiations, there needs to be something of value for them to even want to initiate and help the other party out. And I can understand that side. I understand the royal candidate sides of why they wouldn't want to help out Amelia. But I, however, am not for them just turning a blind eye to innocent people getting killed and, you know, just seeing innocent villagers getting slaughtered. And all More innocent people could die if we get involved, too. I don't know. I feel like like this is like such a biased take because we're empathizing with the villagers, because we relate to them, because we spent time with them. But I guarantee you, if we saw Crucius people get slaughtered because we try to help, 
Chibi, what are you going to say then, huh? I don't think you even thought about it from that perspective. All that. And, and she was bringing up logical points. Like, why would I want this person to be the next royal candidate or, like, the, the ruler of the kingdom if she can't even guard her own domain? Like, why? That was so true. That was so true about how Subaru gaslit Krush. It was like, it's your fault for letting them down. It's like, no. It's their fucking mansion. What, the, what are you blaming me for? Blame Amelia. Blame Roswell. Honestly, blame Roswell the most. Where the fuck is he, bro? Going on fucking meetings when your candidate's about to get fucking assassinated? Like, what the fuck are you doing, bro? Well, why would I want to, you know, have this person rule over me if she can't even defend her people already she has? And that that actually makes a lot of good points. That That's a very good point. She's because, absolutely I mean, correct. Why would you be a good ruler if you can't even defend your own people. True, skill but issue. But then we do know something else is going on here, especially with, you know, the witch's cult. We know Subaru, he's in deep with something, something very bad because we know he's connected to the jealous witch in some mm -hmm. way. So there's probably a whole lot more going on here. And I just feel so bad. I mean, Subaru's in such a bad spot right now because he can't really explain why he knows this information, which that actually was brought yeah. up in this episode, which I'm glad was. It gives us much needed clarification that Subaru can give answers to people about stuff that maybe happens in the future but he obviously can't talk about you know yeah there are ways to skirt around it but you cannot directly reference that you can return to that you can say like these events are going to happen but if people ask how do you know that at that point you know you can't be really answering that and then what do you say source just trust me bro it's not gonna work out it's a very interesting way of nerfing this regression power because again if you know every step if you know every event that's gonna happen wouldn't it be easy to plan that shit out because you know the future steps, but we need a team to work against those future steps. And they're going to question, how do you know that? And because we're looking suspicious, because we're not all allies, now it's like it's working actively against us that we know what's going to happen. It should be easy, but it's suspicious. Therefore, the regression power is nerfed like that. And I think the way that the author is portraying Subaru and his struggles, even though he has such an OP power, Again, we know about the psychological stakes of what it means to die. He doesn't want to abuse that shit. He doesn't want to die. He needs to make everyone count. And we can't easily just get away with telling people, yep, this is going to happen, so you need to help me. And they're going to be like, yes, sir. It's like, nah, that shit's not going to happen. It's like a really good way to handle this regression power. Why he knows these things. I like that. I just like seeing him say, the witch's cult is going to be attacking in like a couple of days. You need to send a force. You need to send an army. And then, you know, like they're asking, well, how do you know this? Like, how do you know these details? How do you know that the witch's cult is going to be attacking unless you're a part of the cult and as we know if normal people like for instance like rim was to look at subaru they will know that he has the masma of the witch the jealous did anyone else other than rim mention the miasma yet or can smell it because i'm trying to think about who can actually do this shit rem can rem was the first one to ever mention it vehicle can right i'm assuming betterugus can Right? Because Betrugu is directly implied, like, why, even though you're so useless, why does a witch love you so much, right? So I think that is, an, it's like, that's like, that's like Betrugu knows that he has the miasma. How? Because he can sense it, right? The whole dialogue. So, Biko, Rem, and maybe Betrugu, anyone else so far? I was hoping that Roswell might know. And I don't know exactly other cult members can. Like, I'm not sure if, the, like, the other foot soldiers, which may be named soldiers, like, the, sorry, the, the fingers can, but I, the archbishops probably can. I'm assuming Puck can. If Biku can sense it, then probably Puck can, because I'm assuming they're still both some sort of spirits, right? What is the connection here? <laughs> like, regular mob, mob beast or, like, witches fiends can smell it, because every time Subaru, you know, uses the AoE taunts, the witches stance, you know, spikes for a bit, so they can obviously smell that shit. But other than witch fiends, Rem, Biko, better use, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, regular cult members did bow to Subaru. Good call. Good call. So maybe they can. Maybe the fingers definitely can. A switch all around him, like the smell of it coming off his body. And I liked how Rim lied for Subaru. Actually took his side, even though she doesn't understand everything. It doesn't seem like she completely believes what Subaru is saying. There's a couple of moments when Rem stares at Subaru as Subaru lashes out in anger. And Rem just he stares in silence and I think... She's kind of judging, like, this ain't the Subaru I remember in Arc 2. She, at the very least, took his side and tried to help him out. When she said, like, she never sensed anything to do with, like, how he's affiliated, maybe, with the Witch's Cult. Yeah, there was, like, a three-second pause, and Cruz was like, Hey, Rem, you think anything is suspicious of Subaru and the Witch's Cult? And Rem's like... 
Nope. <laughs> Light. Even though we know that Rim has asked him once before, like, yeah. you smell just like the witch. You She's the first one that brought it up. Smell coming off you. And I, I just love how Rim took his side. Once again, concreting her as one of the best girls of the series. Probably, yeah, my. I don't like this logic that this unconditional love and simping and glazing for Subaru is the reason why Rem is the best girl of this show. I don't know, man. Like, I see it, I appreciate it. I love how she even like struggled in episode 15 to get to Subaru. I've seen all that shit. I acknowledge it. But like that's the reason this unconditional glaze that just keep, continuously just like enables him and falls into the darkness. Maybe she can save him too. But right now, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's just, it's just, she's just there and just glaze. And I know that she's like trying to help. And again, what I say, Rem should fucking slap Subaru right now. Get your shit together, motherfucker. What are you doing? But nah, you guys are gonna be. <laughs> no, you can't be so mad to Subaru. You're so unempathetic. He's so down on his luck right now. How could you possibly say that he doesn't deserve. Shut the fuck up, pussy. How about the accountability, the lack of awareness, fucking realizing what we're doing wrong? A little slap in the face for a reality check and realizing, hmm, maybe I need to do something better. But if you want a girl just to be there and glaze and fucking, you know, enable you no matter what, even if you're just going down the wrong path, and if you think that's right, go for it, I guess, bro. My, my favorite female character of ReZero. She is definitely my favorite. It's going to be hard for any character really to beat her. Ram would not move a finger to save Subaru. Based. Based. Motherfucker doesn't deserve it right now. That's what I truly feel. Doesn't mean he's irredeemable. Doesn't mean he's terrible. But right now what I'm seeing, I don't like it. And how the fuck am I supposed to root for him right now? I'm waiting for future developments. I'm waiting for him to realize the mistakes and then I'll cheer him on right now. But you can't fucking expect me to like cheer on this idiot that continues to fucking deep diver. Like it just doesn't make sense. Sometimes I read the comment section and it's just like so telling how biased and how stupid people's opinions are about how if you look at a character doing bad and if you criticize them then they're forever bad and no longer can be redeemable like shut the fuck up no one said that i'm literally watching his current state sewer right now and wishing that he returns back to arc 2 mode but a lot of people just deals in absolutes it's either you're for him or you're against him and there's nothing in between and that is just so counterproductive in having any actual genuine conversations about the show after last week's episode of what she did for Subaru, that was some heart touching shit. Yeah, and it was. And this right here, this scene of how she backed him, even though she didn't understand completely, I have a lot more respect for her after. I don't. There's ways to support him without just enabling and glazing. There's subtle things that you can do to be there and be there for him, but also acknowledge the mistakes and try to be better. Simply sitting there in silence and just accepting every one of his behavior just because of the love. I think this is mismanaged love. I think this is inaction. I think this is taida desne. Mm-hmm. Betterugu said it multiple times in episode 15. His psychoanalysis of Subaru being slothful was not the only thing that pierced the soul. It was also Rem. His entire conversation about Rem and how the love was no longer, you know, it was misdirected and it could no longer be met. That was slothful. Rem right now is also being slothful right now. And I truly believe this. That. And then another thing, too, that was going on is the other royal cannons, what they were doing. Like, we had some really scumbag interactions going on, especially with getting to see the one that was like, oh, I want you to lick my foot. That, I kind of understand where she was coming from. She was... Priscilla is a very interesting character. Again, let's continue with this. Testing Subaru to see exactly what type of character yeah. he is, like what his character is like. That was and a I test. see why she was disgusted and why she actually was, uh, why she got pissed off and kicked him because, I mean, he was willing to sink as low as that to actually lick another person's foot just for he can actually save someone else. Or and you would think in this moment where Subaru throws his pride away to lick Priscilla's foot and He's not a degenerate, like, fucking... There's a lot of other characters where they would lick the foot no matter what, right? <laughs> but in this moment, Subaru was actually like, I don't want to do this. But he thought about Amelia, threw his pride away, and did it for her. And I thought, usually if you throw the pride away, things are good. Things were not good. Priscilla got mad. She called us a fucking animal. She said that this is worse than a dog's dependence or a pig's greed. Greed mentioned, right, being greedy. So was Subaru being greedy in that moment? He was being greedy by throwing his pride away to lick the foot of Priscilla to save 
I'm not completely sure if the seven deadly sins here can be really directly tied in. But I think that beyond that, knowing how, again, Priscilla calls Amelia half-wit because she's obviously half-elf and half something else. The way that she calls Subaru again, like, this is worse than dog's dependence, pig's greed. What is this? Animals? And a dog's dependence and a pig's greed, these are things that a human should be able to override because you're a human with intelligence. Half-wit, what does that imply? Lack of intelligence. Priscilla is all about human superiority and being able to overcome these animalistic desires. And because Subaru was unable to override this pig's greed, he was just worse than trash. And he got and she got so fucking mad. Her I I, I wonder what made her be like that? I need some sort of backstory to further develop this character, but she has this irrational hate that Subaru was not able to control himself, right? This test was to see, like, can you overcome your degenerate animalistic desires with your human intelligence? And if you're not, then you're fucking trash. I'm going to murder your entire family and loved ones. Or, you know, actually help out a person he cares about. And it's kind of like he's shitting on Amelia's goodwill for actually doing something like that. Shitting on Amelia's goodwill. Licking Priscilla's foot is shitting on Amelia's goodwill. I'm not sure if I can really agree. And that's kind of why I believe she was pissed. But even then, though, at the end of the day, I still don't... You think Priscilla was mad that Amelia's goodwill was damaged there? I don't think Priscilla gives a fuck about Amelia. I think that she literally thinks Amelia should have never been born and she's a halfwit. Straight up, I think Priscilla is like the closest thing to a fucking Nazi in this show. <laughs> The way that she treats other races and like the way she views like different, you know, species of, of being like, you're not even intelligent, you're a lower life form. That's pretty much just like superiority there, right? I'm not sure about the Amelia Goodwill here. I don't like her attitude and the way she reacted. But out of all the other candidates, though, I think she was probably one of the best. Definitely one of the best natured, even though she seemed to have a very shitty purpose. Best natured? You're going to call a girl that gave an ambiguous test to see if you would lick my toes and, and then say, if you lick my toes, I'll save you. And then we fell for the bait. We threw everything aside. And she says, I'm going to kill your entire family and loved ones over Krush. Because Krush said, I don't want to risk my men to go and save those people. And I don't know about that, bro. I don't, I, don't, I don't know about that. Personality in some way. It seemed like she was one of the better royal candidates out of all the others. Because you have one that's turning a blind eye to thousands of civilians. She's not turning a blind eye. It's a strategic option. She's not ashamed to do it either. It's, it's literally just white knight behavior. There's no reason to fucking risk it. He's about to get murdered. You have one that's like, I need you to lick my foot and to see what type of character you are before I can make my decision. Because if you wouldn't have, most likely she would have agreed to help him out. Yeah, I guess if he didn't, then he would have proved his self but like how is it possible that she's mad that subaru lowered himself representing this master and Millie doesn't even give a fuck about who the master is because it doesn't matter who the master is in this context amelia is out of the equation and subaru is and, and priscilla is specifically thinking about the master servant relationship and this was not something that she respected and the master servant relationship image that she thought Subaru might have had in the back alley was shattered and now she's mad. And there's nothing to do with Amelia. I can understand that. I'm willing to bet. And maybe she might have turned a blind eye and said, fuck you too. But that, that, that's left to be, you know, debated. I mean, we don't know. Subaru most likely will die once again. And we might see him try a different approach with these royal candidates. Because there was one thing that was said in this episode that stands out as a possibility for another reset. What? And that is that Subaru had no idea what he was walking into. He's poor, uh, like horrible at negotiations, which was pointed out most. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's a dumb 17-year-old kid. Straight up with minimal education and life experiences. Most likely in need. Never interacts. Doesn't have soft skills. Just knows how to talk out his ass, right? Completely reasonable that he would fuck up every conversation. Especially the one with Anastasia. That was a fucking master course on the art of the deal. Multiple times. He did not know how to negotiate at all. And one of the big Fair. things I learned when I actually was reading Spice... Also, we never talked to Felt. Because Reinhardt took Felt out for a fucking Volicon photo shoot, right? Wolf ...was that you should know what the person, the other party, wants before you even walk in. That's right, and you need to dangle what the other party wants. The deal is literally 
90% preparation, 10% execution. Before you even get to the table, you need to have all everything planned out. Anastasia had everything set up, everything ready, was dangling, was super wanted from the beginning, got her intel about WrestleFellas, got the fuck out, and then Subaru just humiliated. But honestly, I think Anastasia also told us a lot too. We gained a lot of intel and she gave us lessons that was more valuable than the stuff that we leaked in my opinion. And this is going to be useful in the next iteration. If he actually learned and was not too blinded by rage. To some form of exchange, a trade, or anything, you should know what the other party wants and try at the very least to get them to where you are at an advantage instead of them at an advantage and mm -hmm. you at a disadvantage. And Subaru, he was at a disadvantage throughout the entirety of this episode because throughout the entirety of all these royal candidates' lives, they have been dealing with politics and stuff like the economics, negotiations, yeah. trade. And remember, not only that. Subaru is from modern day Japan and most likely a neat that has no social interactions, no understanding of the culture in this isekai world, right? This isekai world is different timeline, bro. It's a completely different setting. So combine those two things and it makes a lot of sense why he's just fumbling everything. Trading. They've dealt with this probably majority of their life and they know how to deal with this type of world. Subaru, he's just an ordinary guy. I mean, he yeah. got sucked into this world. He's constantly had to die now. I mean, he knows how, kind of how to deal with, you know, dying constantly. I mean, he's kind of a little bit broken, but I mean, he knows kind of how to deal with that. But when it comes to negotiations, politics and stuff, this is a man that knows jack shit. It's like throwing a middle schooler into a middle of like people at like the White House trying to do politics and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, I think that's a fair example. It just, it's not gonna happen. He, he's not gonna have any experience at all. So he walked into all these negotiations not even knowing what to do or how to kind of negotiate at all. And I feel like this is a learning experience for him. It is. For his, Failure. But that's the thing. I hope he actually fucking learns and, you know, doesn't just, like, forget everything out of blind rage. Did he apply some of that to Otto? What happened with the Otto scene? Otto bought a lot of oil. It was out of season. He fucked up. We needed a carriage. We dangled a coin in front of him. But that's not really negotiations, is it? Otto was already desperate. Otto fucked up. Honestly, the merchants and Otto fucked up. They showed their cards to Subaru before we even had to know that shit, right? So immediately Otto's in a shitty position where the bargaining table, the bargaining chip for him is like, oh shit, I got a lot of oil that I need to sell. Now he's desperate and now we can be like, all right, I'll pay for that shit. So I don't know if that was really art of the deal negotiations that we learned from Anastasia, but more of... Getting lucky with the other merchants leaking that this dude needed a lot of shit to sell and knowing that the carriage is what we needed and we happened to have a lot of money and we probably didn't even fucking... We probably bought at like such a high price that we don't even need. I don't know. I felt like that was just a lucky encounter. Still experience for sure. Partnering, trading, but I hope this motherfucker learns something for the next run. In this episode, which it's very apparent he's going to die, especially with how the end of the episode. White was. whale. Oh, shit, he's dead as fuck. White but whale. If he does die, he can approach these, you know, conversations once again, and he can go at a different angle. He can know kind of what they want and what they're seeking, and I believe he'll probably change a lot of his approaches. I, I believe he might go at the one royal candidate that wants her foot licked, he might say, no, I'm, I refuse to do that. And he'll probably- Yeah, that would be an interesting one, right? Just to go back next time and not lick it, just to see what she does. <laughs> she still does the same shit. <laughs> I don't know. Probably actually say like, you know, something else on the lines and maybe she might like him. Or when he goes to the one, the girl that has like a giant army with her, like a Neko army. Anastasia. He'll probably talk with her and he'll Private be the one army. dangling the information in front of her that she seeks. Yes. And he won't completely give it. Imagine that conversation going through this time, right? Like Subaru would be so fucking good at negotiations because he has regression. Like that is the one thing he could really, really hammer in, right? And if, oh man, there's so much things to learn from Anastasia and everyone else, but like, is he learning? I hope he's learning and not wasting these moments. But out and she'll give Subaru more in exchange. I could see something like that happening. Now getting off of all of that, let's just talk about the ending part of the episode. And Whale. that is the stuff that really just threw me for a loop. So... Subaru, he's traveling with a big band of merchants. And yeah. once again, more Spice and Wolf vibes. Like, I fucking love that. I love that shit. So... Subaru's traveling with a bunch of traveling merchants, and he's going to be going to the town to save the innocent civilians and get them out of there before the witch's cult attacks and kills everyone. And he does have a little bit of time to save them. But something happens in this episode, which I'm just trying to ask, like, what the fuck is going on? So there's two things that were very off with this. And for one, 
you had it to where there was this monster that was apparently like invisible, like very dark or invisible, just traveling near the traveling merchants, mm -hmm. and it devoured. What I'm assuming it devoured a merchant's cart, and the merchant. Yeah, there was a bunch of merchants on our right side. They gone, and Otto does not remember. Literally gaslighting, saying, "What do you mean? It's only us here." And I'm like, "The fuck is this a Genjutsu illusion?" Memory wipe? Like, what the fuck is going on with the whale? Like, what happened? We hear the whale, we see the white fog. The only thing that we've heard about before is that it was blocking the passage. And remember the timeline right now. We were getting to the mansion earlier, right? Before, when the white whale was first mentioned, it was already too late and the road was already blocked with the fog. That's what we have to do a roundabout way. And it takes us way longer to get to the mansion and we get fucked up by the cult members, right? And nobody realized the merchant was gone. Like, for instance, he acted like he didn't even exist. That's the craziest part, right? It's that the Otto, Otto was gaslighting us saying, what do you mean? There was no other merchant. It's like, are you the white whale's tamer? Is Otto secretly the white, like the leader of the white whale? Uh, and we're getting baited right now. I don't know. Because the guy that was right beside Subaru, he was like, there was no one ever traveling right beside you to the right. Like, there, oh, there was no one ever over there. What are you talking about? Even though we, as the viewer, we saw it. We know a person was there. But then the man's acting like he yeah. never existed. And you're like, what the fuck is going on? Is Subaru just going so far mentally insane? Is he seeing things? Or is something else happening? And I don't know. Are we crazy? Are they crazy? I don't know anymore. You see this giant creature pop up. And when Subaru puts up his phone, he sees yeah. a giant eye. That part, bro, I was like, do not turn the flashlight on. I don't even want to see it, bro. And the, the whale was literally right beside us. Ball staring at him. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's some form of big-ass fucking beast. that most likely is going to kill him, eat him, and eat everyone there. And probably reset everything. So, I'm kind of curious. What is going on with that? So, he doesn't just have to deal with the witch's cult. Now, he has to White deal whale. with some form of beast that... Well... The beast was already there, it's just that before we never took this route. But yes, if we want to go this route to get to the mansion early, because remember, the timing is very important. If you want to get there early, you got to face the white whale. If you don't, the cult's probably already massacred. Meaning, we need to get over the white whale, so it's like, <laughs> shit. There's another fucking giga challenge. Like, as if it wasn't hard enough with Betsuruki showing up. You giving us another fucking colossal fucking challenge that we need to overcome. And, oh man, we need powerful friends. We need Reinhardt more than ever, man. Well, eat him if he tries to get there early. Holy shit, the world is out to get Subaru. I mean, this poor man cannot... Like the difficulty level again. You can't even fucking compare this to Arc 1 and Arc 2. Like, I thought it was hard enough with Betrugis already, but, like, White Whale just gets thrown in? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, the fuck you want me to do? <laughs> catch a break. I mean, if it's not his head getting lopped off, to him getting crushed, to him fucking freezing to death, to seeing a girl he actually starting to care about die in front of him with a mangled body. I mean, he's seen so much shit, and now yeah. this man has to deal with this. Like, oh my god. The, the writer of this series straight up likes seeing Suru suffer. I, I really... I like it though. It's more fun, right? Of course, Subaru suffering is our entertainment, but like having these new challenges to overcome, like it's just better. It's just like, okay, this is getting really like the stakes are really high now. Really think he does. Kind of sadistic, if you ask me. We didn't get to see the crazy madman from last week's episode. Oh, yeah, speaking about that, a couple of Cheebits mentioned this in the comments below. What? And also mentioned it on Twitter. And I'm gonna just say holy shit about what? this. So apparently, the voice actor of Beetle Kirito. Juice, I'm just gonna call him Betelgeuse Romani Conti das Kirito, yes, Kirito. Fucking Beetlejuice, because that's what many of you were nicknaming. I'm gonna call him Beetlejuice. So that man, Beetlejuice, he, his voice actor is the voice actor of Kirito. I I'm not even joking. Yes, yeah. no shit. Kirito from. And Kirito, honestly, if you go check out his voice acting lines, literally just search his name. You will see characters that you would have never imagined. Remember the reincarnate as a pig? You guys remember that shit? That was like two or three seasons ago. There's an isekai about a dude that gets reincarnated as a fucking pig on a farm for a hot girl. Kirito was the pig. And the voice acting is unreal. Just like Betsuruki's performance, bro. It's unreal. And even this season, isekai Shikaku. Remember the rapper guy? That was Kirito. 
he really goes out of his way to take on roles that really expand on his dynamic range of voice acting. He's not just, you know, main character of Isekai. He's not just standard, you know, pro tag voice actor. He can do everything. From Sword Art Online, that voice actor, that voice actor voices Beetlejuice mm -hmm. in ReZero. I I'm not even shitting you. I'm like, what? Like, this man straight up, this guy, this voice, I hear from Kirito, like, all the time through other anime, he can voice a crazy man? Yep. What? So He's also I Masayuki, just, yes. Props. Props to the voice acting. That voice acting, damn. I, I did not think... Majima from Licorice Rico? Majima was the green-haired guy, right? He was the main antagonist, was he? That was Kirito too? The voice actor Kirito had it in him to do crazy. That that needs some mad props. That voice actor, 10 out of 10 right there. Yes, I agreed. So, yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. How do you I've already given you my thoughts and comments below, but please go give a Chibi a like. Check his channel out if you haven't, and I will see you on the next ReZero video.